Although Walk on the Wild Side is his only indisputable hit, Lou Reed has been one of the most important performers in the history of American rock and roll for over 30 years. His most compelling songs read like a tour of hell conducted by one of the damned, but whatever musical area he moved into, he always made his most lasting and most powerful impression with a simple rock and roll heartbeat. In the late 1970s, he was hailed as the godfather of punk, and now with four superb albums in the space of seven years, Lou Reed is, amongst other things these days, the elder statesman of New York neurosis. Okay, Lou, let's start with the album, Set the Twilight Reeling. Is it fair to say that I think it is, and I think a lot of other people do too, I'm not sure if you do, that's your sort of most uplifting or happiest album, let's say, in about 12, 10 years? 16 years. That long? Yeah. What about new sensations? What does that mean, like, getting out on your motorbike, yeah. putting the money in the jukebox? That was sort of like, you know... You're right. 12 years. Right. <laughs> Am I agreeable or what? Absolutely, yeah. completely. That suits me fine. Yeah. Um, in terms of even the lightheartedness and fun side of it, I mean, is that an important part in terms of, like, this is where you are now? Not necessarily saying that albums reflect where you are at any given moment. Uh, I think sometimes people make the mistake of taking the albums to be a little more autobiographical than it's probably a good idea to take them. I think it's really important that at this stage of the game, because certainly we want you to think we, the royal we, want you to think that this is all real, okay? But having said that, somebody's writing all this and uh, things are made to happen that sometimes don't really happen or it's combining things it's what a writer does with things so i think you can't really gauge my mood necessarily by looking at an album saying oh this is a happy time or this or that time sure but even the approach to the recording would seem with fernando saunders and with tony that the three of you seem to have a good vibe in the studio together or something, and that seems to be reflected in what I hear in the album. I think uh, what you're hearing, um, which was, was the result of two and a half years of working on a correction of the recording situation, is what I would call it. That is to say that after all these years of recording, I had some fairly definite ideas about what I didn't want to have happen again. And this, this record is a result of changing the production, the ways of producing it, uh, which would bring Tony and Fernando far closer together, all of us closer together. But do you always make Not it really further from me than you. Fine, but you make it sound like that's a sort of a... Like, I don't know, that whatever you do in the studio is what we hear on the album, like an almost demo tape type thing, which, is, which it's not really. No, I didn't say that. I said what you're hearing from the studio is exactly what took place under optimum conditions with optimum equipment. It's by no stretch of the imagination a demo. No demo yeah. will ever sound like that. Yeah. The reverse is true. I think if you speak to most musicians, about their albums, they'll say, gee, you should have heard the demos, they were great. The album sucks. The album doesn't have any life, it doesn't really sound this good, it's yeah. this, that. You should hear the demo or you should hear it before it was mixed. And now I've run into situations like that and this was set up to avoid that, not have that happen. Would you think in some way... I mean, this album's written up in audiophile magazines. Yeah. That's. I don't want to scare anybody off. I'm just saying I'm serious about sound. Pedro lives out at the Wilshire Hotel. He looks out a window without glass. The walls are made of cardboard. Newspapers on his feet, and his father beats him because he's too tired to beg. He's got nine brothers and sisters. They're brought up on their knees. It's hard to run when a coat hanger beats you on the thighs. Pedro dreams of being older and killing the old man, but that's a slim chance. He's going to the boulevard. He's gonna end up on the dirty boulevard. He's going out to the dirty boulevard. He's going down to the dirty boulevard. This room costs $2,000 a month. You can believe it, man, it's true. Somewhere a landlord's laughing until he wets his pants. No one dreams of being a doctor or a lawyer or anything. They dream of dealing on the dirty boulevard. 
Give me your hungry, you're tired, you're poor, I'll put on them. That's what the statue of bigotry says. Your poor huddled masses, let's club them to death. And get it over with and just dump them on the boulevard. Get them out on the dirty boulevard. Going out to the dirty boulevard. They going down on the dirty boulevard. Going out. Well, then, do you think the whole result, I mean, the whole enchilada, not just the way it's recorded or the sound or what I hear at the end of the day, is one of your most fully developed sets ever in terms of a complete piece of an album? Oh, absolutely. For certain. So have I just implied that, therefore, there are some things you've released that have been not so much half-hearted, but only, like, hit the bullseye 90% as opposed to 100%? I myself can't listen to any of my old, old records because all I hear is what's wrong with them. So I grade them around 30%. And do you think, therefore, that, like, I mean, even if I shouldn't take it as autobiographical or I should watch that kind of thing, because we're talking about literature here, and it's not necessarily first person, and third person doesn't necessarily relate to the writer and all that sort of thing, do you think in some ways that you've rediscovered a sense of fun on this no. album? No, no, I think that's absurd. But, 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 but hold on, I mean, the last few albums, I'm not saying mm. they weren't fun, but I mean, like, they were bereavement albums. No, I think you missed the point there. It's a shame with an album like Magic and Lost, it was called Magic and Loss, not Loss. Uh, the kind of fun I'm talking about in this studio has to do with problems of production, uh, problems oh, yeah. overdubbing, uh, having a sound that's really good and then having to wait two or three hours to try to record it because they cannot get the proper mic at the proper distance, blah, 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 blah. I wanted to have this all taken care of beforehand. Speaking of Magic and Loss, uh, there's lots of fun on that album. As I said, it was called Magic and Loss, not just Loss. So if you say it's an album about bereavement, you're doing it, or your audience and me a disservice because it was about much more than that. It was about how to deal with contemporary situations, which I'm sure you're as familiar with as yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. And that being the case, how can you get something positive from it? Uh, it's not a dance record, but it's not a bereavement record either. It's a bad rap. So, and to say uh, it's not fun to record, it misses some of what is fun to record. I guess you'd have to be someone who records and a musician to, to understand the fun of creation and watching the thing come to life. But there are apple, you can't compare an apple and a pear and say, well, this is one thing, this is not, I mean, you can up to a point, but you wouldn't want to have all apples, would you? Sure, but I mean, no, what I, I suppose what I really meant with the previous album, maybe, the Sonus Padrella, I mean, that one there was a bereavement album. But hold on, before you define the word bereavement, I mean, there was caricature there, right. as well as say, things like... You're really misunderstanding Songs for Drella. Uh, Songs for Drella 1 was a collaboration, too. It was an attempt, which obviously did not work, <laughs> to... <laughs> to form a, a type of album that I thought of as autobiographical CDs. And I thought, here's an idea that's really fun. You want to learn something about Andy Warhol or Picasso or King George or a contemporary fee, whatever. Instead of having to go to a book, you know, or a CD-ROM or whatever, and have to read all the stuff you would put on the CD, and it would be through music and lyrics you would learn about the life of a person. It wasn't a bereavement at all. It was autobiographical. Trying to, I mean, I really did think that that idea was strong enough that, you know, universities would adopt that idea. Then you'd have sections of CDs. Here's Gandhi, yeah. you know, here's Warhol, here's Picasso, here's Baudelaire, here's Rimbaud, here's Joyce. You know, want to learn about Joyce and songs about Joyce. They'd have to be real good to get to you to listen. But the idea of uh, learning something from a CD about somebody emotionally and spiritually, I think, is really interesting. Hasn't really been looked at. To prove my point, name another album that does that, or even tries to. OK, OK. <laughs> Your point is proved. But wait a minute. What's wrong, necessarily, with saying that even the inspiration was bereavement? I mean, like, if Andy Warhol dies and you record some sort of a song cycle, even by coming back together with a guy that you had fallen out with, John Cale. You want to 
prove me wrong? Is that no, the point of this it, conversation? No, I want to prove both of us right. Well, put it this way. I'm the one who wrote it. <laughs> I know. Nobody but, knows better than I do why I wrote it. But you don't know my definition of bereavement necessarily either. But even forgetting about your definition of anything, it's like, I know why I wrote it. I'm the f writer. Yeah. I wrote it. I produced it. I arranged it. Thing. You can't tell me I know, me but if I out. listen to an album... I mean, I, you can. Am I allowed to take an interpretation out of any album that I you like? You have to. I'm not standing there with a chair and a gun. Right, well, that's the point I'm making, then. So yeah. I took an interpretation out of it, but I'm trying to prove that not is not necessarily... You just shouldn't foist it off on me and say, oh, this is what he intended. I, uh, but, but, you wait, keep it to yourself. It was, a, it was a question. It was, I, mm. said, I, I said, was it? And you said, no, it wasn't necessary. That's cool. Mm. I mean, I'm not saying that you're wrong in the interpretation of what you've written yourself. I'm never wrong. It's a curse. <laughs> okay, well now, um... That's a great line, this designer I know in New York used on me. I've been waiting for weeks. I'm never wrong, it's a curse. Yeah. I'm standing with you on your roof Looking at the chemical sky All purple, blue and orange As some kids are flying by The traffic on Canal Street So noisy, it's a shock Someone shooting fireworks or a gun on the next block. And, and, and I wanna look at working with you. Okay, well, if we even go back then to 1989, I mean, this six, seven year period in terms of the recording. 89 was the New York album. Yeah. Now, that's a fun album. Oh, yeah? Sure. That's a brilliant album, but I don't know about the word fun too much. I mean, you weren't funny having as fun. Funny as in ha ha. Funny as in ha ha, as in you virtually were naming names at this stage. You certainly pilloried those who you felt deserved to be pilloried because if you have sort of the zombied underclass down below, if you have the middle classes who sort of don't care in the middle, and if you have the corruption up on top in New York. I mean, the album for me... In other words, a typical urban city. And what about the whole idea, then, of the approach that you might have in terms of that, like guitar, bass and drums, like on the New York album again, I suppose you should say. Was there something about that that's just so, you know, chords A to E, this is what it's all about, this is rock and roll? I like the democracy of rock and roll. I like the fact that any idiot can play a Lou Reed song and learn it in about five minutes. I love that. I love the fact that folk music, and I think rock is the folk music of the people, by the way, like, if there is such a thing as folk music, it's the electronic rock that people have. And it goes all the way back to caveman times, I'm sure, where I don't think anything they wrote drifted out of that kind of chord change. There's something about that chord change. Yeah. I mean, you hear it in Irish jigs, you hear the same chord change, modal music, it's the same chord change. It's so odd. I'm not odd, it's just interesting. Wherever you go, except for, I suppose, India, Japan, yeah. those types of music, you don't hear that, but you certainly hear it in African music. Like if there's a few things you once said, or somebody once said, I'm not sure if it was you actually, the three things have shaped your life, which is say rock and roll, New York, that was probably somebody else, I don't know, and uh, literature. Now, you, you studied literature in college in 61 at Syracuse University. Did that give you a something for it, or did that actually take a something away, do you think? A lot of people think when they went to formal education, it wasn't very good for them, really, in terms of their creativeness and for whatever it was they were interested in. Oh, I think it was really good to be... I met some teachers I really liked. Um, I got to read Finnegan's Wake in a way that I wouldn't have been able to normally, which was a great thing right there. And what was it about Joyce then? Like, 
I mean, is there something special about Joshua? Is there any part of the Ulysses that you particularly might have seen that might have been a part of you? Well, I mean, well? Molly Bloom's soliloquy is one of the most astonishing pieces of writing in the entire world as we know it. Yeah. I mean, I've read that over and over and over. What an astonishing thing to read. Finnegan's Wake, which I cannot read by myself, yeah. but I had, a, I had a teacher who would read it out loud. And oddly enough, when it's read out loud, it's very easy to understand. It's really funny. But I myself have never been able to successfully read it alone. Well, is, is that teacher Delmar Schwartz? And is it important? Yeah. Uh, like when you met that guy, I mean, what kind of, what did you get from him? Say, I mean, was there something really quite astonishing and amazing about him that maybe he should have been more recognized or something before the madness that he succumbed to? Well, there certainly was something special and unique about him. He was a great writer, and he was incredibly brilliant and very funny, and very depressed. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but out of his mind. Yeah. Do you see yourself as a writer? Yeah. And do you think that the writing But involves... not just a writer. Okay. But do you think that the writing involves an emotion that isn't necessarily you, and therefore to get back to something you said earlier on, don't necessarily take everything on face value as being Lou Reed, you know, Lou Reed's son. Well, fascinating as I am, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not all that interesting. There are... Uh, and also, when you write something, you have to remember, you know, you're taking something over a period of years and you're compressing it and you're yeah. adding people in and you're making things go a certain way, maybe because it's funnier or it's more tragic or it's this or it's that, it's writing. Some people would call it lying. When you have actors, you know, the thing about an actor, and I'm sure they'll tell you, is there are people who are really good at lying. Now, if you want to say there's some real depth to all that lying, yeah, good point. Yeah. there you go, have yeah. fun. Yeah. Do you think in any way that, um, like if you said once that you want to be the greatest writer on earth, that if... Oh, I don't think I said that. Well, okay, well, if it was, if, 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 if it was um, unjustly attributed to you, which it has been, uh, would you say in some ways that if you ever wanted to write or wanted to make the greatest American novel or something, that in terms of what Lou Reed might be, that each album is like a chapter in that novel? I think, you know, the great American novel is just a cliché. Yeah, well, that's that. true. But yeah. I thought, I really do... And I still think it, that if you put these albums, think of them as, as chapters in an ongoing saga of uh, life in a contemporary city in the 20th century. Do you think that if you wanted to be, like, I mean, maybe not the greatest writer in the world or whatever, but like, you did say on Magic and Lost, it can't be Shakespeare, it can't be Joyce, I think it was, and that your ambitions in that field are your realization that you weren't going to maybe go up to the top of that very mountain of Joyce or whatever or Shakespeare had waned and that, that was cool you came to a, an acceptance of something no it's a, well I mean yes and no yes I certainly know that but I've always known that right everybody okay. I think anyone who writes knows that about it's themselves. not though you've no yourself beforehand thinking that you might you'd have to really be in the egotism yeah, of all yeah, time yeah, to say okay. boy I can I can really give Shakespeare yeah. a run Hamlet's nothing look at this one of the things that we saw you most around this part of the world in, in the last few years was with you two, on tour yeah. with you two. On yeah, except everybody thinks Bono wrote Satellite of Love. <laughs> Can I tell them? Yeah. My dears, I wrote Satellite of Love, just so you know. Well, sure, no, I mean, David Bowie with Nine Inch Nails. Oh. Everybody thinks that Kurt Cobain wrote, wrote um, The Man Who Sold the World. <laughs> So, uh, That's very funny. Okay, listen, just one thing then. Like, do you, um, like, if, even if you don't look back on your music or whatever from the past. If what? If you don't look back on your music and, like, mm. sort of listen to it or whatever. Mm. Are you ever. I hear it on the radio, though. Right, yeah. But are you ever amazed and gladdened, saddened, or just doesn't mean anything to you of the effect that Velvet Underground had in terms of, like, some, so, somebody once said that when the albums actually came out first, only 100 people heard them. Every single one of those 100 people Eno. picked up a guitar. You know, it's responsible that, was, for that, was, that remark. It's a pretty good response. Oh, it's, pretty, it's pretty good remark, isn't it? Eno is pretty smart. I mean, like, I mean, he's demonstrated he's still here. He's one of the world's great producers. Uh, I think it's true, yeah. as remarks go. But it, it is, isn't it? I mean, like, it's influence yeah. in the 70s and 80s. is phenomenal. It was a great idea. It's too bad, you know, the group couldn't have lasted longer pursuing it, but it was a great idea. And when you had what I might call a sort of rebirth in some ways with the Transformer and... Um, I mean, you have to just be... to realize you know, if you're around for any length of time, you're going to be stuck singing these lyrics over and over and over. Mm. You really better be good. 
And if you can't engage someone mentally, how interesting can the shit be? And it can't be too trendy because if you're stuck with it 10 yeah. years later, it'll be like wearing some really old socks. Fair enough. Okay, well then finally, Lou, um, as the rock and roll animal of the 1970s, do you think that you did transform into the political animal of the 80s and it's still with you? Because you once said, when you did the Amnesty tour, you couldn't not speak out about the abuse of human rights. Well, some things are just so horrifying that, I mean, I'm not a political activist by any stretch of the imagination, but on occasion there are people I know who are, and they'll bring you something that's so awful, you know, say, I want to go do this, would you help with that, you know, you know, just do a little show or a little, which is easy for someone like me to do, yeah. I mean, yeah, how hard is it to do that? So it's one of the few things celebrities good for, you know, getting a good table in a restaurant and being able yeah. to do a benefit, you know. So I, you know, people, you know, like you uh, 2 or Peter Gabriel, you know, Peter was always ears really to the ground for these things. Uh, I'm not, you know, I, but there are, are certain people whose opinions I take very seriously about these things, and, and then it seems to be the least you could do. And around the time of, say, Coney Island Baby and Rock and Roll Heart, do you think the drugs around that time had blurred the critical impetus, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, the input that you wanted to put into things, and they, it had really gotten away? And so, yeah, I, don't, I don't answer questions like that. All right, well then, one thing then, in terms of yourself, do you think mm. that in terms of the characters that are in the songs, mm. necessarily, do you think you over-identified with them some, sometimes? And you no. start to live the songs? In, in, That's absurd. Extent? Is it? That's really stupid. But why? Sorry. Mm. I mean, like, you just said there that like... I don't, I don't, I don't create a character and then it, it's like bad Hollywood B-movie, you know, like the guy's... One of these movies where the guy's ventriloquist in the nightclub is a very famous German movie, and the puppet starts becoming alive, and the puppet's taking over, yeah, and yeah. you know, and oh, the story I wrote's taking over, and oh, the character Lou Reed's taking over. Oh, please, it's too stupid. It's so romantic. Well, it is. It's yeah. such a romantic way. It's horseshit. Okay, Lou. Trust me. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thanks a million, Lou. Yeah. Satellite of love, satellite of love. 